Hello, today we're talking about the International Federation of Emergency Medicine's Guide to Using Ultrasound for Patients in Shock and Cardiac Arrest. Now, I'm recording this topic specifically for our course of fourth-year medical students who are transitioning to residency, but this is a critical topic for anyone taking care of patients in the acute care setting. But why is it important for the medical student who's about to become an intern? It's because you're going to be working in the hospital. You might be the first one if a patient codes or is about to code. And you're going to learn ACLS, or you already have. But wouldn't it be good to learn how you can reverse PA arrest, or even better, prevent it? That's where this can help you. So when you arrive at their bedside, stay calm, take out your ACLS card, and if they're in PA arrest, you're going to go over your H's and T's, right? But some of those H's and T's, like tamponade, tension pneumothorax, hypovolemia, those are hard to identify, unless you got ultrasound on the bedside. Now, even more important, and the focus for today, is trying to prevent PA arrest. That's the patient in shock. So how can we use ultrasound to identify the patient in shock, categorize what type of shock they are in, and initiate early critical treatment? Here we go. Let's learn some Sono stuff. Now the whole idea here is to take individual point of care ultrasound tests, basic echocardiography, lung ultrasound, inferior vena cava, and put them all together so you can categorize the shock state and start treatment early. Importantly as well, we want to use these individual point of care tests to rule out critical types of shock. Now this exam technique is going to be similar if you've learned the rush exam or other sort of shock exam types. It's a little bit different and it's a bit more simplified. So I like it for that reason. So the sonography for hypotension and cardiac arrest or shock is consensus approach from the International Federation of Emergency Medicine. It's an algorithmic approach, which we like for unstable patients and, sta and patients in cardiac arrest. It starts with the core modalities and then there's supplemental and then even additional views if you haven't figured out what's going on. But you start with just a very limited amount of ultrasound, and most of the time, that can give you the answers that you need. So the core views here, you can see that the core views are just a couple echocardiography views, subxiphoid, peristernal long axis, you're looking for pericardial fluid, and you're looking for a global ejection fraction or ventricular function. That's it. Lung views, you get quick lung views, and you're just ruling out B lines. If you don't see B lines, that's not a fluid overload state. I would add lung sliding into that evaluation to rule out pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax. And then inferior vena cava, just to get an idea of what's the overall volume status and as well as the patient's ability to tolerate fluid. We can't tell that 100% by looking at the inferior vena cava. But if you look at the heart, lung, and the IVC, it gives you a pretty good idea. Supplemental views, if you need to do them, be additional cardiac views and there's a whole bunch of additional views if you need to go there that could be an aorta study to look for a triple a pelvic to look for free fluid ectopic pregnancy dvt studies and maybe a complete fast exam again illustrated here this is from the paper from the international federation of emergency medicines a free available online an idea Kind of a pictured idea of where you start with those core views and then you can expand to a supplemental additional. It just gives you a nice framework of where to start. So you start with the heart, go to the lungs, IVC, and that's going to give you the answer most of the time, and then you can expand from there. So here's an illustration also from that same paper. Obviously the red one here, number one cardiac, that's where we start. So pericardial fluid, global ejection fraction, we got to learn how to do those things. And then we go move on to these lung views. And the top views, you can see, they're like at the apices of the lung. It's the best place when the patient's sitting upright to look for pneumothorax. But also, if you go bilaterally of the lungs and you see B lines at both those locations, then that's a fluid overloaded state. Because the B lines usually start in the bases, right? And then they go up towards the apices as the patient's lungs fill with fluid. 
also seen beelines, rules out a pneumothorax. We use these lateral or lower uh, lung segments as well because that could show us large pleural effusions or hemothorax. And finally, the IVCs in that same sub xiphoid region that you're going to look for the heart. So there's a peristernal long view, and then all of our lung views. And finally, IVC. So those are our core views. The whole idea is to recognize patterns. So let's just go through this mentally, and then we'll go through the individual ultrasound parts. But let's categorize the shock state using the heart, the inferior vena cava, and the lungs. So let's start at the heart. If the patient is hypovolemic, either from dehydration or blood loss, just think you know, logically what their heart's going to look like. The heart is not um, going to have low ventricular function. It's going to have the opposite. It's going to be working as hard as it can to pump as much blood volume out as possible because there is no blood volume. So you're going to see a hypercontractile heart. That's when the inner walls of the left ventricle are touching each other every time during systole. And you're going to see a small chamber size, probably of the right and left ventricle. The opposite is going to be true if you're in cardiogenic shock, CHF or CCF for short. You're going to see a hypocontractile ventricle where the muscle is just not working well. If you're used to looking at that mitral valve, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve as an indicator of how well the left ventricle is working, it's barely going to be moving. And you have a large chamber size. Obstructive shock, either from tension pneumothorax, tamponade, you're going to have a heart that's trying to work really hard usually a hypercontractile heart. You'll have a large pericardial effusion, or maybe just a medium-sized pericardial effusion in the setting of tamponade, and you'll see uh, signs of either RV collapse, RV strain, depending on what type of obstruction it is, whether it's from tamponade or pulmonary embolism. Distributive shock, either sepsis or neurogenic, usually sepsis, is a little bit more challenging because early on we after, often have this hypercontractile heart that's trying to keep up with the, the volume needs of the patient. And as the vessels start to relax and the blood pools within the patient, um, that heart will really work as hard as it can until it starts to become toxic from all those circulating cytokines. And when that happens, then the heart will look hypocontractile, almost like cardiogenic shock, but it's more of a heart stunning phenomenon from all those toxins. Inferior vena cava, if you have hypovolemia, then you're going to see a really flat inferior vena cava. There's just going to be no blood volume. And so that's going to collapse as the patient inspires as they breathe in. It's going to be a lot of variation as the patient breathes. It's going to be very small. The cardiogenic inferior vena cava is going to be the opposite where that thing's going to look huge. Same thing in obstructive shock. The inferior vena cava looks huge. Both those conditions, cardiogenic or obstructive, the volume of the patient's blood is just stuck in those blood vessels. It can't get through the heart, and that's the main problem, so the IVC will look huge. If you're thinking about cardiac tamponade, the IVC is not huge, and it has a lot of variation as the patient breathes. It's probably not obstructive shock. Distributive shock, it can go either way, but often it's normal or slightly small, and we try to use the infravenic cava often in the setting of sepsis to decide whether we're going to give them fluid or not, not a perfect test, uh, but it can give us some guidance. Now the lungs in hypovolemia, usually these should be normal unless you have a hemothorax. That's why I look at those lower segments of the lungs. In cardiogenic shock, if they are having severe cardiogenic shock, usually they have pulmonary edema. So you're going to see lung rockets or beelines bilaterally. Maybe we'll see pleural effusions in the lower segments of the lung by the diaphragms. In obstructive shock, if the tension pneumothorax, you'll see absence of lung sliding on one side. Otherwise, you may see normal lungs. In distributive shock, you could find a nidus for infection, possibly, by doing lung ultrasound. So you could see like a consolidation, focal beelines, perineumonic effusion, things like that. Or they could be normal. All right, let's hit some of these core views. First, we have the peristernal long axis of the heart. Remember, we're looking for pericardial effusions. We're looking at left ventricular cardiac function. You can also look at aortic root size, and we can show you that in person. EPSS, that's E point septal separation. That's when we're looking at the mitral valve in this peristernal long axis to see, get a good sense of what the left ventricle, left ventricle is doing. So we place the uh, phased array or cardiac probe right on top of the chest. We're going lateral, left lateral to the sternum. That's why it's called parasternal. Going to go usually like third, fourth intercostal space. 
Find that space in between the ribs and next to the sternum, because remember that bone reflects ultrasound. And the indicator, depending on the axis of your machine, which uh, side the indicator is on, is either going to be up towards the right shoulder or the left hip. And starting with anterior to posterior, this is anatomy that we're going to see. We're going to see the right ventricle at the top and then the interventricular septum. The majority of what we're seeing is the left ventricle, and that's kind of really what we're concerned about when we're looking at function, at least grossly. You'll see the left atrium, mitral valve, and aortic valve as well. And then at the bottom, if you see a little circle right below the left atrium, that's the descending aorta. And we like to use that as an indicator of where the fluid is, if we're not sure if it's a pleural effusion or a pericardial effusion. So this little rat, or the rat tail more specifically, helps us define whether it's a pericardial or pleural effusion. If you see fluid below the descending aorta, it's a pleural effusion in the peristernal long axis. If the fluid is above the descending aorta, it's going to be a pericardial effusion. So here's a normal left uh, ventricle, normal looking heart. We have the right ventricle on the top, interventricular septum, left ventricle squeezing nicely. You can just see how that muscle is moving really well and just squeezing that blood out. This anterior leaflet of the mitral valve also is moving really well and it can see how it swings up during diastole and hits the interventricular septum. That's an indicator of normal left ventricular function. Right below the left atrium, you can see that there is the descending aorta, just a small circle looking structure there. And this really bright line around the heart is the pericardium, no pericardial fusion here. Now in this heart, we see a couple things that are abnormal. One is that uh, the left ventricle not squeezing as well, especially that apex of the heart, right? So that's kind of the tip of the heart there, barely squeezing at all, so abnormal left ventricular function. And then as we look down at the descending aorta, we can see that there's fluid collections both below and on top. So this is a person that has a pleural effusion, but also a pericardial effusion. Another nice example of a pericardial effusion. So we have fluid on top of the heart, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, descending aorta, and then this pericardial effusion, which is anterior to the descending aorta, surrounds the heart. When you're evaluating for global left ventricular function, you're looking at the organization of the muscle. Is it all squeezing together? How thick the muscle is? And then this E-point septal separation. So that's when that mitral valve swings up towards the interventricular septum. You can use M-mode to uh, shoot a line over the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and that can really give you a measurement of how close it's getting to the septum. We tend to think that six millimeters or less is normal ventricular function. Another example here, a little too much gain on this image, but we have right ventricle, left ventricle, septum, aortic valve, and aortic outflow tract. That's the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, left atrium, and then descending aorta. This looks like a nice, normal squeezing heart. Now I think you can tell right away that this heart looks very different than the last one we saw. If you just look at the left ventricle muscle itself, it is barely moving at all. If you look at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, it's barely opening and it's getting nowhere close to the interventricular symptom. So this is severely reduced left ventricular function. Several examples here. So one's normal, the other three are not. Two are severe and one's sort of moderate, moderately reduced ejection fraction. They probably guess correctly, the left one at the top is normal, just have nice squeezing muscle. And when they really hit that peristernal long axis correctly, you can see that the septum or the anterior leaf of the mitral valve is swinging up towards the septum. The one just to the right of that is a moderately reduced ejection fraction where the mitral valve is moving a fair amount, but definitely is not normal. The bottom two images are both examples of severe Probably the one at the bottom right is the most severely reduced ejection fraction, but just look at the muscle of the heart, that left ventricle muscle barely moving, anterior leaflet barely opening, not getting anywhere close to the septum. Let's move on to the subxiphoid window. So this window has the advantage where it's the most sensitive 
window to rule out a pericardial effusion. So if you really have to rule it out, then this is the window that you want. It can be hard in the obese patient, pregnant patient, or a patient that has abdominal pain. You can also get a nice sense of cardiac function. It gives you a four-chamber view of the heart. So here's the sort of view that we're going to get. The, the uh, chambers closest to the probe or the top of the screen are just going to be the right side of the heart. So right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium. This is the hand position. You're going to see the liver in the view because your sub xiphoid is shooting through the abdomen, through the liver, using that as an acoustic window for your heart. Notice that my hand is on top of the probe. Allow me to control the probe. And this is what you'll see. This is as we sort of fan flat, as we flatten out the probe, we can see the heart much better. Remember, the heart is very anterior in the chest. So if you're pointing the sound back towards the spine, you're probably not going to see anything. So really try to flatten out your probe, put your hand on top of the probe itself. You'll see this nice sort of four chamber view. As we get to the end of the clip, we can even see a little bit of the aortic valve. So here's an example of a pericardial fusion in tamponade. Tamponade is really what we're concerned about. This is a patient that was actually stabbed, so we were really had a high index of suspicion this might be going on. But on top of the image, we have liver. Right below the liver, you can see that there is fluid around the heart. There's even a solid material within that fluid that's actually coagulated blood that's in the pericardial space. And then right on top of that, closest to the probe, is the right side of the heart. So we see the right ventricle, just barely because it's being collapsed by the pericardial fluid. A little bit of the right atrium also being collapsed. And then the left ventricle, left atrium is below that. Pericardial tamponade or cardiac tamponade is defined on ultrasound by collapse of the right atrium or right ventricle during diastole. That's what's happening here. This pericardial effusion has created so much pressure inside the pericardial space, it is collapsing the right side of the heart, causing obstructive shock. Another example here, we have liver on top. Right below, we have a large pericardial effusion, and there is a solid component again here because the blood is coagulating. But you can just see how it is crushing the right side of the heart, causing tamponade. Move on to lung. So we've evaluated the heart, both in the peristernal lung and sub xiphoid core views. Now we're going to go to the apices of the lung. And when you go to the apices of the lung, you want to point the indicator of the probe up towards the head so you can see two ribs, that shadow, because it blocks ultrasound waves. And then in between those ribs, you'll see the pleural line. The pleural line in a normal patient is going to, you're going to see sliding back and forth as the visceral and parietal pleura slides on itself. You're going to see that in ultrasound, especially if you use the linear high-frequency probe. If you see that, it rules out a pneumothorax. The other thing that we're going to evaluate for is B lines. We've got to use a deep probe for that, so either the phase rate or cardiac probe or the curvilinear probe. So here's a CT image of what we're doing. Ultrasound's on top of the chest. We're shooting that ultrasound at the ribs, but really we're looking in between those ribs to see that the pleura sliding back and forth on itself. And if we see that as the patient breathes, it's gonna rule out a pneumothorax. The other thing we see here in this normal lung is we, so we see ribs on either side, first of all, that are shadow, and then this pleura line in between, there's a little bit of movement there. It's subtle when you're first learning this, but after you look at a few, it becomes obvious where you can see the sliding back and forth. And there's these little lines also coming down from the pleura. These are not B lines, they're too small. And if we used more depth, we would see that they don't go down to the very bottom of the screen. Also, they don't obliterate the A lines. Now, A lines are normal. A lines are just a factor, a reverberation artifact from the pleura that happens whenever you ultrasound air. These little lines coming down from the pleura are called comet tail artifacts. That helps us identify that the pleura is up, that the lung's normal. So common tails and then normal A lines. Both reverberation artifacts. Here is a patient that has a pneumothorax. We have ribs on either side, shadow, and then pleura in between them. It looks about the same. There's even an A line. 
Remember, A lines will, will be there because even in a pneumothorax, we're just looking at air. The difference here, no sliding, no comet tail artifacts. You can use MO to facilitate your ultrasound for pneumothorax as well. If you shine the line right on the pleura, and remember what MO does stands for motion, gives you motion over time, over a single line. In the chest wall tissue, there shouldn't be any movement if the patient's not moving, so that you're going to see straight lines on top. Below that, where the lung is, if it's normal lung, it's going to be moving back and forth constantly, sliding back and forth, and so all that ultrasound will be sort of mixed up. We call this a seashore sign, where you sort of see sky, then beach, then sand. That's a normal M-mode ultrasound. If the patient has a pneumothorax, that bottom part that's mixed up because the patient's moving their lungs will be gone. So you'll just see straight lines the whole time. We call that a barcode sign. Here's a nice image, an example of a lung point. A lung point is nearly 100% specific for identifying a pneumothorax. And that's when you have normal lung on one side, pneumothorax on the other. This is where the pneumothorax begins. So we see rib shadow like we normally do. We see the pleural line but on the left side of this image. Sliding, right side of the image, no sliding. You have two false lung points that you can identify in the chest if you're scanning, and you can avoid calling it a pneumothorax by just knowing where you're scanning because the false lung points happen where the lungs end, either at the diaphragm, so if you're scanning way down towards the diaphragm, just be aware of that. And then also at the interface between the lung and the heart. Image on the left here is at the diaphragm where you can see it, the lung sort of tip. And that's just because we're headed towards the diaphragm here. And then the image on the right, you can see a little bit, so this thing beating a little bit on the right side. That's just the pericardium we're seeing. And then the lung sort of comes in and sweeps in. So false lung points, those are normal. Now here's what the ultrasound will look like when you use a curved probe or a face array probe will look like this as well. You're gonna see sliding at the top of the image. It's a little bit more subtle because we're not using that high frequency probe, but you can still see it. Still see rib shadows, a little bit more subtle as well. We see several A lines here. And so this is normal to see all these A lines and this is what normal lung should look like. Now here's what B lines are or lung rockets. You can see the pleura sliding on top, so lung rockets or B lines automatically rule out pneumothorax. But what they rule in, if there's three or more in a lung field, is fluid inside the interstitium of the lung. Most of the time, that's pulmonary edema, but that can be cardiogenic or non cardiogenic. We'll also see this with pulmonary contusions or infarctions. Pulmonary fibrosis will also look like this. So if there's an interstitial process, you'll see B lines pneumonia as well. So here's the patient, one who's normal on the right, one who has cardiogenic shock on the left. If you just look at the hearts first on the bottom, you have a normal heart on the right, on the left, a poorly contracting heart, mitral valve not swinging up, muscle not working, and then on the left lung here, lots of B lines, lots of lung rockets. Right lung sliding, A lines only. So that's how we categorize these things. This is a, a screenshot of an image from the blue protocol. This is a protocol um, developed by Lichtenstein et al. And they did a lot of work with lung ultrasound and they just talked about how they use ultrasound to categorize what type of um, issue the patient's having if when they're short of breath. And this profile A they're talking about on the left that's the normal patient. They have lung sliding, they have A-lines everywhere you look, bilateral chest. If that's true, then you should sort of treat that as like a normal chest x-ray, like a normal lungs, and think about what other things could be causing the patient to be short of breath. A patient who has bad asthma or COPD would also look like that too, so that should be a consideration. Profile B, they have B-lines everywhere lung rockets everywhere. So that patient is the one that probably is in pulmonary edema of some sort. Multifocal pneumonia, both on both lungs, that is possible too, but might look a little bit different. And this profile AB is the one where they have normal lungs on one side and then they just have focal B lines somewhere. So 
just on one side of the chest or one part of the lung. That's usually pneumonia. Let's go on to our last core view is inferior vena cava. And this is where we really assess the intravascular volume status, try to get an idea of their grossly volume overloaded or underloaded and see if there's any respiratory variation. And we're, we're really looking for extremes because the, anything in the middle, not a super accurate test, but if that IVC is huge, it doesn't move at all with respiration, gives us good information if it's really tiny, moves a ton, collapses 100% with respiration, that gives us good information too. You're gonna use the same sub-xiphoid window as you do for the sub-xiphoid cardiac view. The difference is the indicator points straight up to the head because you want to get a long axis of the inferior vena cava. And in that view, you want to see the right atrium as well. That's how you really confirm that's the inferior vena cava. And then you also know you're looking at the right location because the area you look to identify uh, what the volume sort of status is, is two centimeters below the hepatic vein. If you're looking way deep in the inferior vena cava, that's not going to be an accurate exam. So in this view, you see a long axis inferior vena cava and the blood is dumping right into the right atrium. Everything on top is liver. And you can just see as the patient breathes in, you have about 100% collapse this inferior vena cava. Definitely not grossly volume overloaded. And probably, probably could get some fluid. Here's an opposite situation. So a patient who's in cardiogenic shock or has uh, obstructive shock, their inner inferior vena cava is going to look like this bottom right image where it's just huge. It looks like fluid is not really moving. There's no change with respiratory variation. Let's go on to the supplemental views. So you can add a peristernal short axis and apical four chamber if you haven't really got the answer that you want, because you can get a little bit different information from these views. The peristernal short axis, it's another great way to look at left ventricular function, to look for pericardial effusions, and to evaluate the, the septum and the pressure within the right side of the heart, as well as look at the mitral aortic valves.